we generated as well as some surveys that uh, we had done. And then I'll just end with some lessons learned, some pretty pretty high level overview of, of some takeaways from, from our experiences. Okay, so the project area, we're, uh, we're up here in the Northeast Pacific. Uh, it's an area called the Northern Shelf Bioregion, which is one of four bioregions identified in the Canadian Pacific Ocean, and it covers just over 100,000 square kilometers. Uh, it's an area of relatively healthy marine ecosystems containing a range of species and habitats, uh, including Pacific salmon, halibut, rockfish, killer whales, sea otters. It's a long list, kelp, eelgrass, uh, corals and sponges, lot, lots going on um, in, in a very, uh, yeah, generally quite a healthy marine environment up in that area. So the project overall for an overview, it's it's the Marine Protected Area Network for the Northern Shelf Bioregion. And the vision is an ecologically comprehensive, resilient and representative network of marine protected areas that protects the biological diversity and health of the marine environment for present and future generations. So well, that's the, the ultimate vision and, and, and kind of overarching goal that we're working towards. Um, the initiative is being led by the Government of Canada, the province of British Columbia, and a number of First Nations, which are the Indigenous peoples from the area. So a number of uh, First Nation organizations and governments. Um, in addition to that, we have stakeholder advisory committees that have been established to support the initiative and the stakeholder groups include representation from commercial and recreational fisheries, aquaculture, from tourism, uh, marine shipping and transportation, forestry, um, and that may seem odd, but a lot, but a lot of our, our, our wood is still moved uh, through marine channels. Uh, and some of our log sorts and, and storage areas are adjacent to the uh, coastal areas. Um, and as well, we had uh, local government as well as uh, folks representing sort of the con conservation sector or the NGOs. So I'm not going to go too uh, into the um, all the aspects of developing a network scenario, but I will touch on a few elements here. Um, and that's around the development of design guidelines. Um, so, so one of them, um, as you would have seen from the, the vision there, is to get representation of the biodiversity in the region. Um, so that's, that's a key one and one that we'll be talking about the most in today's exercise. But there, there, are, uh, there are other design guidelines that come into play, like around replication. So getting multiple instances of the range of biodiversity there's size and spacing of MPAs, there's connectivity, there's quite a long list of design guidelines to consider. Um, and a couple of those as well are to maximize the benefit and to, and to minimize um, what we call maximize the positive, minimize the negative. So to avoid undue um, challenges for some of the human use activities or socioeconomic activities that also occur in the space. Uh, similar to Elska's presentation, being aware of all the all the other users out there, and when you're doing the marine spatial planning aspect of of uh, designing a an, a network of marine protected areas. But circling back to the representation of biodiversity, to inform that, we need to know what features we're trying to protect and how much of each feature we're looking to protect. So for the MPA network process in the Northern Shelf, we went through a process of identifying all of our conservation priorities. <clears throat> and uh, the conservation priorities, they're, they're, they've been identified to help focus the design and analysis on important features and areas to protect in the region. So we have a suite of ecological conservation priorities. So those are the, those are the species, the habitats, the communities um, that are most important to conserve in the network. And then we also have the First Nations cultural conservation priorities. So that's areas that are important for harvesting culture and spirituality of the different indigenous groups, um, as well as culturally significant species. And obviously there's a lot of interaction between the ecological conservation and the cultural conservation. A lot of these culturally significant species are also ecologically significant. 
And then we had target ranges that were assigned to each ecological conservation priority to guide the amount of each feature that ideally would be protected within the network. So just one example would be 20 to 40, you know, a range of 20 to 40 percent of the eelgrass in the region would ideally be captured within the network, captured and protected, I should say. So in terms of the C sketch tools uh, that we look to for helping helping the planning and the engagement, um, so MPA network design and MSP, as we just saw, um, require access to viewing and analyzing spatial data within the project space. Uh, it's important to note that all the partner staff involved or uh, nor the stakeholders have access to geographic information systems, um, that being the typical desktop application that folks doing spatial planning um, might use, um, but the, the benefit of C-Sketch is, is it kind of puts the GIS tools into the hands of people who might not typically have access to those. Um, so it's important for the partners and the stakeholders to be able to view potential candidate MPAs to, to assess them and provide feedback, including suggestions on boundary adjustments or alternative sites. OK, so I'm just going to run through some of the basics here. Um, so we, we have our, our, our sort of standard map viewer. This, this provides the spatial data sets that are available internally to partner planners and managers and externally to stakeholders. There is an access, um, a way to sort of act, uh, control the access privileges such that you're able to restrict sensitive data sets from some viewers. So there were definitely like we have now well, I, I know we just went through this exercise and I think we've got something like over a thousand actual data sets up there. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of access, there's definitely some that are internal to the partners while they're working on developing draft scenarios. And then those are shared out to the stakeholders to to provide comment on. There's also some data sets that uh, different partners um, keep restricted to themselves, whether it's around special economic activity or just very sensitive ecological features um, that, uh, you know, putting exact locations is, isn't really seen to be a benefit. So here's an example of, of the same space with, with a, some of our spatial data uh, presented. Here we've got a number of, of shellfish uh, tenures uh, showing up the, the orange orange dots. There we've got some Cassin's auklet uh, colonies showing up. The, they're the circles, the pink and red circles. Got uh, the halibut um, mean, mean annual catch showing up. That's sort of the gray going to yellow to green to blue uh, there. And then also areas of high rugosity or, or benthic complexity in orange. So again, we have we have hundreds of, of layers up there. And uh, this is just a, a kind of an example of some of those. Other key data sets, of course, are all the existing conservation areas, um, a, a range of other human human activities, all our habitats, um, marine mammals, uh, information on the various fish species, etc. OK, so then um, again, as we saw in the previous presentation, um, this, one of the powerful aspects of C-Sketch is the ability to create sketches. Uh, so to be able to draw areas. So again, you've got a few here and one that's in edit mode. This enables users to create and share sketches back and forth, adjust boundaries of, of existing sketches. Um, these, these could be drawn while viewing other data in the background so that you can uh, either capture features that, you, that you're trying to include in the network in the case of uh, some of our conservation priorities or to avoid features, um, you know, say in a really important area for commercial fishing or some tenures that have been identified for either shellfish or log storage and handling or wind uh, future wind power. Um, It also uh, one of the interesting things that we built in was the, the ability to to identify which activities would be proposed to be allowed to continue in the marine protected area. And that was a really important um, aspect for us because 
one of the, some of the functionality that we built into this report uh, with the folks at McClintock was the ability to to assess all the conservation priorities that within the MPA against the activities that were proposed to occur. And then if there was a negative interaction between those, we could start downscaling or reducing the contribution of that MPA or protecting that particular conservation priority. So it wasn't just a protected, not protected. It was a protected, but then affected by the proposed activities that would continue in the space. So that leads us to our, our, our next slide here. Um, if I can get it to change. Uh, which speaks about reports. So we did have a number of reports developed within C-Sketch that we could run. Um, they were, uh, they enabled us to assess individual zones as well as a collection of zones. Um, so we had reports that just provided an overview of the de developing network, sort of what's the size of the total network, what's the average depth, um, if it was a particular zone, what's the average depth within that zone uh, and the depth range, um, what's the overlap with existing protection for a particular zone. On the ecological front, we would look at which, which conservation uh, priority features were captured, the proportion of those. Uh, we would be able to introduce that scaling of the contribution based on allowable human use activities as well as compare those results with the desired uh, target range for the species. And then we also had a report looking at the human use uh, features in terms of the overlap with various human use activities to get a sense of the potential impact on, on such things as uh, commercial fishing. So I don't know how well you could see this, but you know, here's an example where you do have a list. Um, you know, this is page one of eight, but you get a list of a number of the species that would be occurring in here based on the data. Um, it would give us our, our unscaled or the, the total amount there. It would give us the, uh, the amount in higher protection areas, which would be introducing that, that scaling to some degree. Um, and then it would, uh, we could compare that then with the target range of, of 10, say 10 to 20%. So, you know, this is just one small area in a larger, larger space. So a lot of these are fractions of a percent. So um, we're not gonna meet our targets out of one spot, but it helps us as we build um, get a sense of what an individual zone would contribute. And then when we do an assessment or report on the full collection, we get a better sense of how, how well we're, we're uh, doing against our targets. Um, I did also want to say that uh, we also had the ability to export those reports um, in, in CSV files and bring them into Excel and other, other uh, software to, uh, to compare different scenarios against each other. So that was great. That was great to be able to put that functionality in the hands of um, both the uh, both the um, the planners themselves amongst the team, um, but also stakeholders. Uh, so we were able to to share this out to stakeholders and allow them to look at a proposed draft network. They were then able to make sketches um, that they thought uh, would have you know reduced the impact from their perspective um, on their sector. Um, but also work towards achieving the conservation priorities. Um, or say the, the sector in question was the, uh, was the conservation sector or an NGO, they could say, well, you're actually falling short of this target with your scenario or your draft network. We'd like to see you add a couple more areas here, here, and here, and then they could submit that to the planning team for consideration. So that was great. We we uh, we had a few sectors that really picked up on the technology and ran with it. Um, I would I would highlight the uh, the commercial fishing sector as well as the conservation sector um, as being the two that really embraced the technology and took the opportunity to to engage on that level. And then for other other folks um, that maybe weren't as inclined to get into the tech technology or really sit down and learn C Sketch. Uh, we had basic surveys built in, and this enabled uh, 
this enabled other folks to 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 view a draft scenario, um, to look at a survey, to make comments. For example, here about uh, you know you could provide general comments, you could provide zone specific comments, you could recommend a boundary adjustment, or you could recommend a change in the proposed allowable activities. But you would do all this through a through a survey form. So a little more more straightforward, um, and a little more um, in line with what some stakeholders are accustomed to. So that was just another option for getting input on the uh, scenario. Um, yeah, I was just gonna wrap up here with, with some, some lessons learned. Um, so the main takeaway is that the online data portal and the associated analytics um, have been a, a very useful tool, super helpful. And I, you know, I'd actually say they've been instrumental for, for both the internal planning and stakeholder engagement. Um, folks are, are still internally using the site every day just to check um, visually what data is where and look at um, you know the location of sites and potential conflicts or potential opportunities to improve. Um, I'd say it takes a, a fair bit of time and effort to set it up properly so that it functions well for users. I mean it's a it's a very for those who who use GIS or who are involved in planning, it, it's quite intuitive setting it up for users who aren't familiar um, to that world um, does take a little bit of time just to try to make it as intuitive as possible to organize all your data layers in a way that uh, makes sense to you know have the written instructions and the layout of of the uh, of the reports and the tools um, there so that people can can grasp it fairly quickly uh, we learned that some stakeholders will avoid technology uh, and not embrace it, um, no matter what you do. Um, it's just not a, a good fit. Um, I think it depends on the age to some degree, the demographic of the folks in the different sectors. Um, that seems to be an influence on the uptake. Um, but I think that's just a reality. There'll, there'll always be some folks who just won't uh, won't go down that road. Um, and then another takeaway. Um, <laughs> For us is just be careful what you ask for. Um, you know, dealing with large amounts of detailed feedback and input takes takes a lot of time to work through and assess and decide to incorporate or not. Um, and especially if you're asking for alternative sites or or even full alternative networks to come back, um, it can be it can be a vast amount of information to uh, to kind of work through as a planning team. So something to bear in mind as well. Um, all to, you know, not to say it's not useful, lots of good gems in there, but definitely a, a lot of work. Um, and I'll leave, I'll leave it there. So thanks, folks. Thank you very much, Chris, for this informative uh, talk. Um, next up is Will. Will, please uh, go ahead. In fact, we're going to, I'm going to pass it on to Maddie, who's going to speak first. I'll go sure. after her. No worries. Okay, Maddie. Great, thank you. Um, let me just get my screen going here. All right. Can everyone see the presentation? We can. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for um, the great presentations. Um, you know, it was really interesting to kind of look at how students have engaged with C-Sketch and then um, going through um, Chris's project, looking at how different stakeholders, st stakeholder groups engage with C-Sketch. Um, what I'm going to talk about more is how we view C-Sketch to as a tool to engage with the broader public through participatory mapping surveys. Let's see. Um, so before jumping into C-Sketch, um, I just wanted to quickly go over why we do this, because you'll see um, it's quite a bit of work. Uh, so what is really motivating um, launching these participatory mapping surveys? Um, and first of all, it provides more information. So, you know, in many sites that we've worked in, and as many of you probably know, spatial data on ocean use and activities can be really limited and is sometimes even non-existent. Um, you know, we, we tend to think that there's a lot of data out there, but when you get down to it, there sometimes really isn't. 
Um, and then also for certain sectors like fishing and transportation, um, at least in my experience, I find that it can be really broad. You know, these global data sets or countrywide data sets aren't always appropriate for um, sometimes the scales that we're working at. If we're, you know, we have a really small planning area or working, um, you know, in a small island nation with a really small EEZ. Um, and then the second thing that really is important and kind of motivates these projects are that it engages the public in the process. So um, launching and kind of having this um, tool and and communicating about this tool is a way to also inform the public about the broader marine spatial planning project that you know this data is going to inform. Um, and then also it's interactive and it's personal and that we get to ask people questions about themselves and people often enjoy talking about themselves and revealing their preferences. Um, you know, note that isn't always true for certain sectors, as I'm sure, um, you know, others can attest to, but generally it's a nice way to establish a more personal connection with um, the people that will be affected by marine spatial planning at a given site. Um, so why is Seasketch a great tool for collecting this kind of social, um, you know, ocean use data? Um, the main thing is that it really has a couple of key advantages over using paper maps, which is kind of how I think it's been done mostly in the past. Um, first is that the interactive, you know, um, maps can contain a lot more data than paper maps and that we can host many layers that you can turn on and off, you can zoom, you can pan around. So it provides a lot more information that um, respondents can look at than a paper map. Um, it, it helps us store responses digitally. So, you know, as soon as a respondent submits um, kind of shapes and drawings, which I'll go through a survey and show you what that looks like in just a second, um, you know, that that those responses are locked in and um, helps ensure that we don't lose them or misinterpret responses um, because paper maps have to be transcribed and adding that extra step, you know, introduces more opportunity for error. Um, and then it is nice and portable, so we're not limited by having to carry around a bunch of stuff and paper um, or materials, and we can kind of, you know, ingest unlimited responses to the survey. Um, that being said, there are trade-offs. Chris mentioned this a little bit um, also in that there are certain sectors or certain people that aren't comfortable with, um, you know, using the computer interface. Um, but in that case, we usually often provide a paper map option. Overall, we found that having C-Sketch is a really, really helpful tool and helps us kind of um, collect a lot more data than otherwise would be possible with paper maps. But it's always there in case people do prefer that. So now I'll just quickly show what these surveys look like. Um, and uh, the two places that we are kind of really in the midst of either um, launching a survey or kind of crunching the the results of survey are Maldives and Bermuda. So um, I'm just going to click through the Maldives survey to get an idea of kind of what these surveys look like and and the questions that we ask and these really vary by site. So um, can everyone see this? Hopefully that worked. Yeah. Um, okay, perfect. So um, this is the C-Sketch interface and the nice thing about the Ocean Use Survey is that it's, um, you know, we have a hyperlink that brings people straight to this page, but they also have access to everything that Elska and Chris showed in their presentations, such as data layers, um, planning, they can change the base map, they can look at legends. So, you know, they have, the, they're in this survey interface, but they also can interact with C-Sketch, um, kind of the, the whole site while they're taking the survey. So um, you usually have like an intro message here that kind of briefs uh, participants as to what is going on, why are they taking the survey, how will the data be used, include hyperlinks to places they can find more information, um, and then you know contact information for people that will what can help them out. Um, and I'm just running through this pretty quickly, so I'm not going to kind of touch on all the things, but I just wanted to show um, what the interface looks like and that it is dynamic. So we can ask questions such as, you know, are you taking this survey on behalf of someone else? Um, if you say yes, then we ask for your name and the facilitator's name. Um, we can ask where, where do you live? Where are you living right now? And 
brings up kind of additional questions, you know, which atoll, which island. Um, so this is really nice in that we can collect a lot of information and kind of um, start with a simple list of questions that is changing as they're answering and inputting information. And then the real kind of crux of the survey is right here. So what sector do you present? And this is where um, we ask the respondent to identify kind of what ocean use or activity they want to be responding for. And I'll go over a little bit more how we do this, um, kind of make these lists in just a second. But once they choose a sector, um, then they're asked, I'm going to skip over this part. This is just kind of looking at group responses. Um, they're asked to draw a feature. So clicking on this blue button here, you can add a feature. This is for aquaculture and mariculture. And again, you can kind of just see how they really have so much more access and flexibility than if they were trying to do this on a static paper map. You can zoom around, you can pan in. If I want to change the layers that I'm seeing, maybe I want to look at bathymetric contours. I can do that here. Um, so that's really nice. And then once they're ready to start drawing, uh, they can go ahead and just click on the map. You can see here, this is a giant aquaculture area. It's just for demonstration. Um, draw their shape. They can give it a name if they wish. And then they also give it a value. And this is really important because this helps us um, create the final product that both shows kind of you know, the most frequently drawn places as well as the most important places. Those are the two kind of main things we're really trying to dig into. So what places are used the most and also what places are most important for each sector. So that's kind of what it looks like um, to, to the respondent. Um, once they finish drawing, they can save and continue survey. And then we usually just have a few additional questions on um, demographics just as an internal check for us to make sure that we're getting a diverse array of respondents. So um, next I'll just kind of go over what the process is for creating and launching the survey because it's um, quite a bit of work and um, involves a lot more steps than I think um, my, a, a, another kind of C-Sketch project um, might have because it is public facing. Um, so this is obviously a really simplified version of the timeline, but kind of covers the main stages of the process. And I'll briefly go through each of these in a bit more detail. Um, but I just want to highlight here also that it's definitely not a short process. Um, I think so far in my experience, I've seen that, you know, from start to finish, this can take one to two years um, and just the amount of people that need to be engaged and the amount of different materials that need to be created. And, and you'll see that as we walk through it. So first I'll go through um, survey scoping and design. So in this stage, kind of what we're really looking for a couple, try to answer a couple, couple different questions. So first is to identify the respondent groups, which would be really similar to kind of the process Chris spoke about by identifying that, those stakeholder advisory groups. And now we're asking kind of what sectors or ocean use groups we want to know more about. So maybe where do we have data gaps? Um, as well as, you know, what sectors or ocean use groups would be affected by a marine spatial plan. And that's thinking more about who do we want to get, engage in this process? Who do we need to reach out more? Kind of to that second point I mentioned on why we collect this data. And usually we start off with a pretty standard list. So, you know, fishing, um, energy, offshore energy, shipping, um, and then recreational or conservation scientific uses. But then this can really change a lot based on the sites that we're working in. So, um, for example, in Bermuda, we had just two types of fishing, um, recreational and commercial, whereas in the Maldives, we started off with two types of fishing um, and ended up with four different types of fishing. Because um, after speaking with government officials and, and different kind of experts in the fishery sector, they really felt that we needed to have um, two commercial fishing groups, tuna, non-tuna, recreational fishing, and then artisanal or subsistence, subsistence fishing. Um, so that was kind of one example of how, you know, these things can really change. And, and it's really important to engage with um, the experts because they'll know a lot more about how best to, to reach all these different groups. Um, the next thing that we need to kind of think about is demographic identifying data. And 
this kind of serves two purposes. One is to um, make sure that each respondent is unique and that we can verify respondents. So that's kind of like a quality check, making sure this is actually good data that we're collecting. Um, and the other is that we're, you know, again, making sure that we have diversity, you know, a, a diverse spread of respondents. And so usually age and gender, as I showed, or standard ones that we, we usually use here. Um, however, there's sometimes additional groups that we want to make sure have balanced representations that are site specific. So for example, in the Maldives, there is an important and politically significant distinction between part-time and full-time commercial fishermen. So we ask respondents um, in that particular survey, which one, which group they identify with so that we can make sure we don't have too many respondents from one group or the other. And lastly, um, we want to um, identify kind of additional details, whoops, additional details we might want to know about what's happening in these ocean spaces. Um, so for some sectors, you know, in addition to just drawing that shape that we can label, okay, this is an aquaculture shape. We can also say, this is, a, this is a commercial fishing shape and ask the participant to also indicate what um, gear types they're using there, maybe what species they're fishing. Um, if we're looking at something like boat charters, maybe we want to know, are you taking multi-day charters here? Is this just for diving? So this kind of allows you to fill out that attribute table for that shape. What other additional details um, do we want to know or would be useful to collect? Um, and the key here, you can already kind of see how all these things can snowball into a very complex survey, is striking a balance between gathering that important data that's essential and, and useful and also making sure the, the length and complexity of the survey is kind of uh, staying under control because um, if we have a survey that's too long, we know that people won't take it, they won't finish it. Um, we need to make sure that people are able to, to stay engaged in the survey and not feel overwhelmed by how, much, how many questions we're asking. Um, so the next phase is kind of setting survey targets. And this is kind of really part of survey design um, and the scoping process, but I've broken it out because this is a really important step in all survey methodology. And it is really what ensures that we have a large enough sample size, um, both to make the data usable and trustworthy. So um, one thing that we do, you know, across all surveys that we set sector targets. So We'll conduct a power analysis using census data, employment data, or past surveys, whatever data we can really source from well, usually the government or our collaborators working in a site. Um, but sometimes that's not quite enough. So for example, in the Maldives, um, after consulting with, with the fisheries ministry, um, they, they did not think that the, the results from the power analysis were was was enough of a large enough sample size for for fishermen in particular and they changed those targets um, to be a bit more ambitious because of the importance of engaging fisher fishermen um, and um, that's just an example of kind of making sure that we consult with the right people for just kind of charging ahead um, another thing that's often really important especially with participatory mapping um, is setting location-based targets and that's because people tend to draw areas close to them um, and then they might not think or kind of forget about areas that aren't close to them. And this has been shown in a lot of um, participatory mapping literature and studies. So having good spatial coverage of where people live is important to gathering information um, that's, you know, kind of spread evenly across the entire planning area. And we saw this in Bermuda actually kind of really starkly. We um, had these kind of initial results for fishing and our stakeholder advisory committees looked at the map and they thought this is really strange. There's some key fishing grounds that are really not showing up a lot and have not been indicated. Um, and that was because after drilling a little bit more into the data, um, we had really only gotten, we had gotten more responses from fishers on one side of the island. Um, so that allowed us to look, um, that allowed us to basically communicate with, with the teams on the site and say, okay, we need to get more responses from fishers on the other side of the island to get a more balanced understanding of fishing grounds around the entire island. So it's also just important during the survey process so we can to kind of keep track of our respondents and make sure that we're adjusting kind of the strategy on the ground as it goes. So again, um, the kind of key here is making sure that we have enough data to conduct analyses, but also have enough data to make the public feel that this was a fair and trustworthy process. So those are kind of the two main things we're going for when setting survey targets. And 
The next piece is kind of once we've designed the survey, we've set the targets is deploying the plan strategy. So how are we going to get the survey out there? Um, and that really kind of comes down to two different um, main strategies that we have to think about. The first is thinking about how people find out about the survey. We need to communicate that this is something that is happening. Um, and we basically, you know, have this is an entire project in itself in that we um, need to figure out the most effective ways to raise awareness specific to that site. And we have an entire comms team that helps us create materials, hire facilitators, and access different networks of communication. So that might be, um, you know, creating public facing websites that have kind of all the information about the survey in one place and have access to the survey. Um, that's creating YouTube videos with interviews from ministers or local scientists or local NGOs um, that, you know, can be put on the website, but also on other communication channels like social media to, um, you know, raise awareness and en engage um, people that way and also using um, kind of press releases and, and working with other media channels. So it's a lot of work. Um, and we also usually need to contract local communications experts to help with things like graphic design, translating materials. You might have noticed on the Maldives survey that we had um, Divahi text in addition to English text, which was um, really important and a huge amount of work to kind of get that all translated and put into the survey. So um, it's a, you have a whole nother project on its own in, in that getting this out there and making sure that people know about it. And then the second piece of the deployment strategy is thinking really critically about how are people actually going to access the survey. So um, it, you know, depending on the site, people may have different access to different technologies. They might be mostly on mobile devices, um, in which case at the moment we aren't able to host CSketch. So we're using a another software called Mapshaner to where we kind of have a duplicate survey and they can access um, the, the survey there. If they're on a desktop, maybe they can um, access C-Sketch, but maybe we need to have kind of community meetings where um, there's a desktop, there, we have facilitators that have desktops and kind of bring that to people. Um, so there's lots of different things that we have to think about. Um, you know, in addition to technology access, also community structure. So who are community leaders that we can reach out to that, um, you know, are, are trustworthy and can help kind of gather people around this. Um, so it's just, it's understanding access, it's understanding community structure, politics, and perception. Um, a lot of different kind of considerations go into thinking about how will people actually be able to take this survey. Um, and so once we have this, the survey out, people know about it, people are taking it. It's usually um, active for a couple months. And then um, we, once we kind of you know, either hit survey targets or hit kind of the deadline that we need to wrap this all up, then we can start crunching the numbers and do some data analysis and create some products out of um, what people have told us about their ocean space. Um, so what do we usually do? Um, it can really depend on the site, but generally we always have to kind of create a summary of the demographic breakdown of who we reach. So um, create tables, graphs to show kind of who actually took the survey in summary and, and kind of show people what the process looked like and um, kind of the, the, the spread, the, the outreach. Um, the main kind of data product, which you'll see here are what we call heat maps. So these are the way that we summarize all that spatial data into, into rasters. And again, um, because people are both drawing those shapes and adding um, a value to those shapes, we're able to kind of have these maps where um, red areas are both areas that, you know, have been indicated frequently, but also highly valued by respondents. And these are two examples from Bermuda. So you can see kind of the distribution of commercial fishing, which, um, as you might guess, was pretty widespread. Um, most of the near shore area around Bermuda was quite important. But then you can compare that to recreational fishing. You can see it's a little bit more specific. Um, so these are kind of, and then we do this for each sector in getting kind of these heat maps that show high value areas for each sector and low value areas for each sector. Madeline, I'm sorry and to interrupt, we're running a bit out of time, just as a reminder. I have one more slide. Oh, perfect. Yes, <laughs> okay. um, yeah, and so just wanted to, this is all kind of summarized into a report that's public facing, um, available on multiple channels, 
for people to view methods, results, and heat maps. And last thing I want to say about this really quick is that the heat maps are used both as a visualization tool for the public, but also as an input to the prioritization process, which helps identify um, places for um, high conservation priority. So it's both um, kind of something to show people and it is a data input to kind of the next process in the marine spatial plan. So last thing I just wanna say is um, moving forward, what are, what are we going to um, incorporate the C-Sketch next, which is kind of how I'm passing this off to Will, which Will will cover in a lot more detail. Um, but in, you know, projects so far has really helped us envision improvements we can make. And the three main ones that we're really excited about are um, support for mobile devices. So um, having C-Sketch available on mobile devices so that we can, um, you know, we don't need to rely on another software because most people honestly in most of these sites are accessing um, the survey via mobile device. Um, we are recoding and repackaging the heat map algorithm. So those maps I just showed right now, they're created separately in, in kind of um, ArcGIS and um, our, it's kind of a more opaque process and our eventual goal is to have that as a feature in the survey tool that's actually able to create those maps and display them in the browser, which would be really exciting. And then lastly, thinking about maybe some kind of user design, um, maybe incorporate some kind of type form design where people are moving through different pages instead of having it all in one form, as you saw, something more like Survey Monkey or maybe something people are more used to seeing. Um, so those are kind of the main ideas. And I will wrap it up. I know it was kind of a rapid fire um, review, but we'll pass it off to Will to talk more about C-Sketch next. Thanks. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. And uh, next up is Will. Thanks very much. Let me pull up my screen. One second. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thanks, Maddie and. Elka and Chris, um, it's a lot of fun for me. I'll, I'll be talking about um, C-Sketch 2.0, um, which is internally called C-Sketch Next. Um, but let me let me begin with it, just a little bit of background. C-Sketch actually has its root in a marine protected area planning process called the Marine Life Protection Act Initiative. This goes back to the early 2000s uh, when the state of California and, and the U.S was attempting to create a network of MPAs. Uh, it was an ambitious effort that was met with all kinds of resistance. And one of the biggest problems that we had at the time had to do with stakeholders who felt like their interests weren't being represented. So fishers felt like they were being screwed. Conservationists felt like they were being screwed for different reasons, obviously. Um, but a significant reason why people were feeling this way was because they didn't have access to the same tools as scientists and technologists had that, that allowed them to make these informed decisions. Um, they also didn't have a platform that helped them feel as though their opinions mattered. So my team uh, at UCSB partnered with the Nature Conservancy and EcoTrust to build Marine Map, um, which was a web accessible free and open source tool that gave stakeholders access to the authoritative database of maps and these tools for designing, evaluating, and sharing ideas for MPAs in California. And that application was used heavily and received well by stakeholders and using that tool, Marine Map, the stakeholders designed a network of marine protected areas that covered 16% of California's state waters, which was a significant conservation achievement. And following that experience, Jack Dangerman, who's the CEO of Esri, provided a financial gift to my lab at UCSB that seeded the development of C-Sketch, which is this software service that reflected some of the same design principles of Marine Map. So today you've heard about some of the applications of that tool. The idea behind C-Sketch is that anyone with, an inter with internet access and a web browser can view this authoritative information, contributed information about how ocean space is used, draw and evaluate spatial plans, and then collaboratively design spatial plans with other users. And we developed C-Sketch, launched it in 2012 using a combination of proprietary and open source technologies. In some cases, people could use this platform for free, especially if they used it for educational purposes. Um, but it is a software service or SaaS developed and hosted by my lab. Um, 
naturally web, web accessible. It's used pretty widely over about um, 700 projects and over 9,000 users, but in most cases, the use of C-Sketch requires some sort of attachment to UCSB, my university, particularly when it comes to developing those analytics and reports. And to be used for planning purposes, which is really the primary use of this tool, it requires a paid license and uh, development services provided by my lab by way of a paid contract. Last year, we received a grant from the Waite Foundation to redevelop C-Sketch from the ground up, totally modernizing the technology and publishing it free and open source. So at almost nine years old now, C-Sketch is a bit long in the tooth and it's, it's high time we, we redeveloped it. Our focus will be supporting the Blue Prosperity Coalition, which at the moment means that we're supporting marine spatial planning in Bermuda, Maldives, Federated States of Micronesia, Samoa, and the Azores um, with an additional five countries next year as part of this, this coalition. We're continuing to support our current projects with the legacy version of C-Sketch, but we'll start to phase that out when we launch the new version of C-Sketch next spring. And when that happens, anyone in the world will be able to go to csketch.org, click a button, and create their own C-Sketch project for free. So what are some of the significant changes to C-Sketch in our upcoming 2022 release, which is again codenamed C-Sketch Next? First, as I mentioned, the architecture is built entirely on free and open source technologies, and, and that, that has wide ranging implications for end users, project administrators, and developers. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of detail on this slide, and it's really only here for your future reference if you want to get this slide deck for me. Um, for, those who are, for those who are really interested in the technology self, uh, stack itself, but suffice it to say, this, this rewrite has a lot of advantages in terms of performance, flexibility, cost, and long-term maintenance. Currently, the project administrators are limited to using Esri REST services and OGC services like WMS to visualize maps that are hosted on third-party servers like ArcGIS Server or ArcGIS Online. GeoServer or Map Server. C-Sketch Next, however, uses a combination of the Mapbox API and our own content delivery network that allows people to use these same services, so as we Arc Server, ArcGIS Online, GeoServer, Map Server, and Mapbox tiles. So practically speaking, this means that administrators can pull in data from a wider range of sources and in many cases apply custom symbology to layers. So this gives administrators a greater amount of control over how these dynamic maps look and behave. And this is just a sneak preview of the admin dashboard to show you some of the tools that will be used to pull in vector data from say Arc Server or some other source and then store the data in C-Sketch and then change the symbology, symbology to meet your needs. Uh, so as any project owner like Chris can tell you, hosting costs for data can be really expensive and relying on third-party servers can be problematic, problematic for any number of reasons. Storing data in C-Sketch will uh, be free and you won't have to depend on uh, a default layer symbology from whoever published it. You'll be able to actually mess with that symbology. If they're vector data, you'll be able to use some basic cartographic tools to ensure that symbology for the features is well suited for your project and purpose. Um, Maddie mentioned a little bit of this. Uh, because C-Sketch Next can actually store the data, this kind of sets you up to, to use C-Sketch offline. Currently, uh, you've got to be connected to the internet to access map services. In C-Sketch Next, you'll be able to configure your project to download at least a subset of the data and, and features for offline use. So in remote areas, for example, where you don't have internet access. Even though internet access is becoming more and more available, uh, we still find plenty of use cases where we want to visualize these maps, sketch and evaluate zones, or conduct surveys in areas where there's no internet access. So I think this will be uh, very useful. Um, Maddie mentioned this, that the current version of C-Sketch runs only on a desktop or laptop computer connected to the internet. But the next version will be compatible with mobile devices and tablets. This is especially important for projects that use surveys like the ones Maddie talked about. A huge number of potential users want to be able to answer a survey on a smartphone, for example, and that will finally po be possible with C-Sketch Next. So, uh, 
Perhaps the most important change in our architecture boils down to this geoprocessing and reporting framework. Currently, the reports that you see after you sketched a zone, like the ones that you saw Chris present, um, and like ones I've shown here highlighted in red, they rely on two fundamental pieces of technology. First is ArcGIS Server. This is Esri software that runs on a server that's set up on Amazon Web Services or AWS and run by my lab. The geometries that are created by users are sent to ArcGIS Server, which then runs any number of geoprocessing services that have been authored by our developers and then the results are then sent back to CSketch and presented to the user in the form of a report. Again, that report is authored by developers from my lab. And this, this is, you know, th that operation is the foundation of geodesign, a term uh, used to describe iterative sketching and analysis. And as Chris mentioned, one of the most powerful features of CSketch. But implementing that feature right now depends on help from my lab. You've got to contract us to develop these geoprocessing services and reports simply because of the limitations that are imposed by the current CSketch architecture. With CSketch Next, we've developed a custom geoprocessing and reporting framework with an open API that can be accessed by developers anywhere. So if you've got JavaScript programming skills, you can set up your own geoprocessing services hosted on what's called AWS Lambda, a serverless architecture, and write your own reports. Keep in mind, this does require serious JavaScript chops. There, there will not be a simple user interface for building analytics and reports. And it will require setting up some AWS infrastructure. But for those that have the capacity to do this, uh, it will mean complete independence from my lab and consequently greater long-term sustainability for projects. And then there, there are a lot of ancillary benefits to this new architecture. Because it's serverless, it's much, much less expensive to run. Instead of paying thousands of dollars a year to host Arc Server on AWS, you can now run these analytical services for pennies. In the past, CSketch project owners often had to shut down their projects after funding ran out, but now it will be possible to keep these projects running indefinitely because they, they cost practically nothing to host especially if they're not being heavily used. Uh, no license fees and practically speaking, no hosting costs for geoprocessing. <clears throat> so in fact, we've actually, uh, this, this framework is actually running alongside CSketch now, uh, but we won't be exposing that API for others to use until the fourth quarter of 2022. Uh, and another really nice feature, as, Man as Maddie mentioned, um, will be the ability to generate heat maps from surveys <laughs> like the ones she showed you. Currently, Maddie does all this on a desktop GIS and then publishes the heat maps to an ArcGIS server and then exposes the results in CSketch. But our developer, um, Tim Welch, has, has created a new open source tool that can generate these heat maps called spatial access priority maps on a desktop computer um, but in CSketch Next, you'll be able to generate them in the browser using that same tool and expose the results to end users. This will be this will dramatically improve the workflow and speed at which you can present survey results to be used for planning. So just to, to summarize, um, here are the things that are coming in CSketch Next. Most importantly, it's free and open source with no licensing fees. Uh, there will be greater flexibility in the sorts of map, map source data you can use. There'll be that open API for geoprocessing and reporting. You'll be able to create those heat maps in the browser. It'll be mobile, compatible, offline capable, but still have some of the, the basic features that you've, you've seen today, the map visualization, sketching analysis, surveys, and forums. So with that, I'd like to thank, really thank the Waite Foundation and Institute for their tremendous and ongoing support. Um, I want to thank uh, Chad, Tim, and Maddie, members of my team at UCSB, um, the panelists, Elska, Chris, and Maddie, thanks very much, and, and to all of you for your attention. And I'm uh, excited to uh, have a discussion or answer questions if I can. Thank you very much, Will. Um, I would like to propose to have a, a quick break of uh, 10 minutes and then we can start with our discussion panel session. So should we just meet here at 4.30? Sounds great.
Great, cool. So we'll see you in a minute then. All right, is uh, everyone back or are we still missing someone? Maybe uh, since we're such a small crowd, we can also all show our faces if you're comfortable with that. Hey, Oscar, you're back, cool. We're still waiting for the others. Chris, cool. Imco, Madeline. All right, thank you. So we already had the first question from Will, and he's interested to hear from the participants about their experience related to marine spatial planning and decision support tools. If you're so, willing. If you're willing, no, yes. No, no, of course. Is there anyone uh, who wants to share their experience with uh, decision support tools in the context of MSP? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I can start. Um, I have a PhD student who's working on serious gaming and about learning processes in uh, uh, the, the translation from individual learning within a game to more organizational learning in uh, 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 policy and, and and planning and I was also wondering in um, how you uh, what what your uh, experience is in the way uh, C-Sketch is used by planners and how it's translated in in planning and 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 uh, all marine spatial planning so how how C-Sketch is used by planners and how yes yeah. 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 Well, typically, um, I, mean, I don't know if I can say typically. I, I've worked in probably 25 or so different uh, marine spatial planning exercises. They all, of course, look a little different uh, depending on where in the world we're working. I, I'd, I'd say that um, the initial vision is for planners to have a tool that's accessible to as many people as possible so that they can participate at every level of the planning process, right? So from contributing their values and ideas to sketching and evaluating plans and sharing them with, with other users. Um, so the planners will um, you know, go to great lengths to make the tool uh, known um, and have ho hold meetings where members of the public are invited to see the tool, learn about it, gain access to it. But um, a lot of the work often comes down to um, a steering committee of, say, 20, 25 people who are tasked with creating the, the plans. Um, and then, um, you know, there a, a fair amount is um, sitting in meetings where somebody's driving the bus, so to speak, showing it on a screen or sharing their, their screen over Zoom. And, um, and they're trying they're doing their best to capture um, the ideas that are expressed verbally by mm -hmm. members of that committee um, and then as the as the planning process progresses the planners are are more um, likely to sort of give give uh, those committee members homework where they're asked to go home um, answer surveys sketch and evaluate plans share them in the forum and then after a, a period of you know, maybe a year or so, uh, those the the planners will will take the the data that are generated in the surveys. They'll take the plans that were created and shared in forums, um, and go through a series of uh, you know sort of the next steps are presenting the the uh, the the plans that people have created, and then ask them to um, get closer to a consensus on what that 
network of marine protected areas are, or that network of marine spatial plans should look like. So, you know, opening up the public, having these meetings, allowing people to freely sketch any kind of plan, and then having some 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 structure by way of these committee meetings or stakeholder meetings where they're asked to get closer and closer and closer to mm -hmm. a single uh, shared vision for what the network should look like. And are then in that in that process also uh, political decision makers involved? Because in 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 the end, it's a political choice. Um, how is the translation from uh, uh, discussing the data, uh, discussing areas, uh, uh, dealing with this uh, conflicting interest? Mm -hmm. um, how is that? used in C sketch or is it a tool before the political decision making process is taking place? Yeah, it's a great question. And and it, again, it differs depending on where we're working, but a common uh, sort of setup is we've got an MOU, a memorandum of understanding that's established between uh, the, the, um, the government, sort of lead government agency uh, that kind of blesses the overall process. Um, the process being there's a representative stakeholder group that's comprised of members from all, all different um, uh, you know, stakeholders. Um, and that group is <clears throat> tasked with coming up with a set of principles, objectives, and so on. Um, and once that, once that group has uh, Create the vision, goals, principles, objectives, um, and which undoubtedly contains lots of uh, language around uh, reducing conflict, uh, coming up with a plan that maximizes benefits for all stakeholders while reducing impacts to, to marine ecosystems. The, the agreement really is that the government will, will take that plan and sign it into law unless there are you know, some major problems with it. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is a political decision in the end, but the way that the process is usually set up, the, the, the agencies will pr pretty much take that, um, uh, that the, the plan that was generated by the stakeholder group, give it to the minister, the minister will move it through the cabinet and sign it into law. Um, that's, that's usually kind of the way it works in the end. Am I am am I allowed to have a last question? Please. Uh, I I really liked all 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 your talks from the student involvement to the real planner to the setting of, of sea sketch. Uh, so thank you for that. And I was intrigued by uh, what who the stakeholders are. And 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 Chris made a nice. A comment about uh, a kind of exclusion of stakeholders of self exclusion by avoiding the technology. Um, are there also, uh, do you have experience with, for example, very powerful stakeholders like uh, the shipping industry, uh, assurance uh, companies related to shipping, uh, IMO? Um, are they at all involved in this kind of serious games or are it the more visible stakeholders like fishery, uh, wind and uh, wind energy, uh, coastal communities? Yeah, um, shipping is one of the more interesting ones. Uh, um, I, I have, have been involved in um, some marine spatial planning processes where in fact, shipping industries have been one of the more involved uh, stakeholder groups. For example, a, a planning process in California where we were talking about one of the major topics was was rerouting ships, creating new shipping lanes to avoid uh, whale strikes. And they were incentivized by uh, essentially um, a some funding that gave them a financial reward for slowing down uh, in certain areas where this working group had determined were sensitive whale habitats. Um, so, in that case, it really was a it was a uh, um, a process where the ports, uh, you know, port authorities 
and the the, sh the representatives from Merck and you know other uh, other groups like that were were very much at the table and interested in in um, you know finding some sort of solution around uh, you know s s places to slow down and places to reroute their ships. Um, but it's it's almost always the case that there's a big group that that feels as though <laughs> they don't they don't have much stake in the game or they don't want to play along. And usually, in my experience anyway, they start to come to the table uh, when they see plans starting to develop that could uh, impact them. If they're not at the table, you know, uh, participating in the conversation, they, they discover that they might have a lot to lose in the end if they don't participate. So they might come in late in the game, but they usually show up. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yep. Maybe I'll just I'll just add to that with an example from from our our process. Certainly, um, we have the Chamber of Shipping that sits on our regional advisory board, and and very similar to what Will was saying at the end there, they they sort of keep an eye on how the plans are developing, what the latest scenario looks like, and start sort of evaluating where it may kind of intersect with their interests. Um, uh, Transport Canada um, is also part of the governance committee, so as being a, one of the uh, uh, programs for the government of Canada, they keep an eye on on you know kind of the interests from their perspective as well. Um, and they're an interesting one because through the MPA network process, a lot of the sort of behaviors we'd like to see shipping take within an MPA ideally would also translate outside of the MPA. Like, you know, we wouldn't be looking for slowdown in the MPA and then just, you know, if you see whales outside of the MPA, it doesn't matter. So so there's definitely a little bit of an approach to, um, yes, being aware where there's sensitivities of shipping within, say, the boundaries of an MPA, but then also trying to determine whether an MPA is necessarily the best tool and maybe actually looking to <clears throat> adjust best practices through the ocean space writ large from, from that perspective. So. Yeah, that's it's a good point. They are a bit of a unique one, and they definitely coming from that international uh, like IMO perspective. Getting into sort of local planning is a bit of a challenge for that particular sector. Cool. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions from the two participants that are left uh, at this point, or? Uh... Yeah, I do actually. Oh, please, yes. Yes, okay, so I was wondering um, at what scale can CISCAT be used? Because, for example, um, I myself am uh, now an intern at North Sea Farmers. We are an offshore uh, seaweed cultivation organization. And we are planning on making an offshore, uh, well, seaweed plot. And I was wondering um, on what kind of scale could you, um, well, draw on the map, for example. So um, our current plans are like, one square kilometers big, but in the future we will go larger. But it will be nice to use a program like SeaSketch. Yeah, um, it can it can really be used at any scale. Um, we, in fact, it, it has been used for aquaculture planning at the scale that you're you're describing um, off the coast of Southern California. Um, so, yep, it, it, it's a uh, uh, really, there's no technical limitations, of course. It's um, it's it's really comes down to what kind of scale data you have to support planning at that scale more more than it does have to do with limitations of SeaSketch as a platform. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. How do you update the data, uh, and, and where are the data coming from? And if if I, for example would like to make a kind of planning for the Black Sea. Uh, who is delivering the data? Are you delivering the data? Are uh, European, non-European countries in the Black Sea uh, providing that data? And so, yeah. Yeah, they come from all over, um, mm -hmm. but you can think of, of them really as, as two buckets, if you will. Um, there are authoritative data sets that live out there on the internet, and they are in ARC server, ArcGIS online, governments are publishing them, academics are publishing them. <clears throat> and for those data, they're really easy to just 
pull into C sketch. So in, we didn't show that, but in the, in the administrative interface, you basically just take the URL of an existing yeah. data set that's out there, paste it in there, and then expose it in C sketch. So in that case, you're just presenting um, an authoritative data set that you don't have any control over. You're relying mm -hmm. on, on the way it looks and all that, which can be good or bad. Uh, then there are the, the data that we often discover when we're uh, you know, setting up a project. Uh, once, you know, once the MOU has been signed and we're off to the races, um, then we start collecting data from you know, individual scientists or uh, groups that have uh, specialized data sets that are not publicly available. Those data I will put on ArcGIS server or in ArcGIS online and then expose them in C-Sketch. Um, but as I mentioned in the next version, there's actually going to be some facilities in C-Sketch to just pull those data directly into C-Sketch itself and host it in C-Sketch. Um, so yeah, the data kind of come from all over and, and we usually start the process with, with this kind of data discovery process, um, invite as many people to the table, ask them to provide data if they've got it, um, and then um, it's often the case that once we start planning, uh, those people who are reluctant to share their data start to see the value and start to understand how we are protecting their data, and, and uh, they start to offer it up, and we'll go through the process of adding it. Fascinating, yes. I, I, I have a lot of questions. It's, it's, it's a new field for me, but I, I, when, I, when I think about uh, the next decennia when uh, there will be um, maybe exploration uh, permits for the deep sea mining, yeah. for example, in the Pacific, or uh, tuna fisheries in the high seas, and it's always difficult to get those data. So it's yeah. it's very in interesting to to have such a tool um, which makes uh, planning very vi visible. Mm -hmm. uh, and the the more realistic the data, the more realistic you can you can make the planning and I can imagine that within the territorial waters it's more easy than uh, in areas beyond national uh, jurisdiction. Uh, yeah. yeah, and there, there are um, some pretty neat data sets that are now being um, made uh, available like Global Fishing Watch, I don't know if you've mm -hmm. seen those, but we're working now um, with them. Actually, this week uh, they've exposed an API to their to their site, so that we can now um, both pull in and visualize Global Fishing Watch data in C Sketch, but then also use them analytically for when people are sketching zones. We can think about how much fishing behavior we displace by putting an MPA in, even in, in an area of, of uh, beyond uh, national jurisdiction. And then there are global data sets like. Um, uh, the Allen Coral Atlas, um, that's obviously usually within areas of, of national jurisdiction, but um, but those are those are data sets that we'll also be able to pull in and in any project and analyze. And so there's just more and more of those data sets that are, that are coming available and easily exposed. Am I allowed to ask also a question, a question to Elske? Uh, I, I really like the way you work with C sketch in in uh, in student <laughs> courses, and I was wondering how how do the uh, what how do how do students think about C sketch and how do they relate to, for example, to uh, the marine policies and regulations in, for example, the North Sea? How do how how do you connect uh, the 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 gaming with the learning about, uh, uh, for example, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive or the Marine Spatial Planning Directive, the link between yeah, the, the data from the game and uh, learning about uh, the planning and the regulation. Yeah, yeah um, the, well, the, the students find using C-Sketch very, um, very nice. It's uh, uh, quite easy for them to understand how to use it, and and to get into your uh, question about 
how the legislation and the policies fit into this. They, they um, within the module they have it's like a nine week period and they have four meetings and um, um, parallel to these uh, meetings they have uh, like uh, lectures about the the marine uh, uh, strategy framework directive and all these legislative um, mm -hmm. uh, parts in the north sea and um, and then they have those that information they also read the the, the policy documents uh, beforehand before the meeting so they have like these uh, the knowledge of what is going on and then uh, within C sketch they um, they can look back at for example the Natura 2000 areas or the nature protected areas uh, they they see that back on the maps and um, I think that's that's um, yeah very uh, um, they understand it very well. I also played the game myself as mm. as a student. That's the first time I I encountered it encountered the uh, the game, and the, my personal experience was that it was very nice also to just visualize what was. Uh, on paper in in those documents those uh, those policy documents and then being able to see those things uh, back on the map that's um, from the student perspective very nice they they get yeah. to understand better what is going on in, in the north sea yeah sounds very interesting yeah yeah, yeah. thank you oh. Elska, is it possible for, for those of us who are interested to, to get our hands on your uh um lesson plans uh yeah definitely i that, that would be i'd love to see those yeah we have like a um how do i say this and uh, like um with stakeholder descriptions and like learning goals they have to uh, uh, uh commit to so i will uh share that with the group great thank you find it we also have a question from Sereno um, in the audience, please. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Well, sorry for not opening the camera. I'm having big internet problems today. I even have to get in. Um, so yes, thank you very much for this. It was very, very interesting. Uh, all the examples, I would also like to have the, the class plan that Elk did we we did some um study and with that with in, in our university here sorry um i'm a phd student from federal university of santa catarina southern brazil and and we are very interested in this uh new um c sketch next and and i hope we can use it um i'm i'm working currently with social mapping too in an ocean area um, and my uh, data gathering is going to start in 2022. So hope, hope we we can use uh, Sketch to maybe use data or at least present the data. I think it's it's, it's a great platform. And I, I would have a question, could be for Madeline or even Chris, how you guys uh, use the survey especially to to interact with these stakeholders that have more limited to technology how was that process please yeah i mean i can i can give uh, an initial response <clears throat> so yeah we, we we've tried to enable a, a range of options for for people to to sort of interact and, and provide feedback so we do have the sort of you know the extreme end is where they're working to create their own scenarios or their they create their own network and that that way they're fully embracing the technology we have the surveys that are embedded in c sketch where they can look at the the draft um, network and provide comment um, through the tool that way. And then we've also provided a hard copy or, um, you know, sort of digital um, like Word documents, Excel type surveys, um, you know, through email. So so we've kind of gone 
multiple avenues. Um, we've provided PDF copies of the maps that could be printed out and then had Excel forms they could fill in as being sort of the most basic. Um, and, and then again, there's also, we've also received basically from meetings, um, say with the, uh, there was a sport fish advisory board, which is a group of recreational fishing where they actually went in meetings and we got just a whole bunch of hard copy, um, handwritten uh, feedback um, as well. So I think, you know, we've tried to to have different avenues for, for different um, different participants um, uptake of, of technology and, and we basically will take whatever we get and we'll, we'll we end up translating it all into one sort of uh, kind of feedback log and then we work through that as the planning team to uh, do our best to respond and, and well consider and then respond to, to, to the feedback that we get. So can I ask just a little follow up question to that before Maddie? Um, yeah. If you have something, uh, what size team are we talking about to to gather that and deal with all that information? Like you said, well, so, you asked for. Yeah. So the so the the gathering um, on the on the more the hard copy end that was the sport fish advisory board um, folks themselves, and then they deliver <laughs> deliver to us. Here's a stack of of feedback for you. Um, literally a stack of paper. And then we had a, a team was part of the MPA technical team folks on that go through and log all that feedback and assign it to a to a particular zone. And then we've got the log um, from the version back then that we can go through and okay, here's the site, here's what we've heard from the different sectors. Um, so yeah, a little bit of effort certainly, um, yeah. And, and and it's certainly easier when it comes in off of a digital survey where you can just download it and it's already in the log form. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and I'll just add that for for kind of the larger, broader public, when we're doing the participatory mapping surveys, that we oftentimes do have to hire facilitators um, to go out and help those who may not want to engage with the computer or want to, but are having a hard time with it. Um, and we also have kind of the whole team um, on deck with contact, contact information shared. So in case people are having trouble, they can they can contact um, team members as well. So it's just something you have to kind of budget into the project as well as kind of an additional aid. So Maddie, in, in the Maldives where they've got 1,100 islands, how many facilitators are going to be hired? Well, we're in that process right now. We would like 40, which would give us kind of two people to tag team each atoll. There's like 20, 25 atolls. So far we have 10. So um, we'll see how that goes. But yeah, it's, it's a whole process. Thank you very much. Thanks, Karina. I also have a question for Chris, actually. Um, I was wondering if there is something like an integrated management plan for uh, British Columbia or something like an overarching policy framework. And uh, well, what I was wondering is how does you, your work fit into that if something like that I just mentioned is uh, present? Um, what I mean, are there any kind of exclusive usage shown already designated or do you just take care for like other interests of stakeholders via the participatory uh, environment you created? Yeah, good question. So, so there actually is an integrated management plan for the same footprint, um, Pacific North Coast Integrated Management Plan, and yes. and one of the actions coming out of that plan is is the development of the MPA network. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Um, so, so in some ways, our work nests underneath that integrated management plan. Um, in addition, there's individual um, the footprint we're working in has been divided previously into four subregions and the province and a number of the coastal First Nations um, in those different subregions have um, their plans as well. Uh, so we already have four subregional plans that we can draw on, which, which provide guidance for some of the activities, not all because the federal, federal government wasn't involved in the development of those, those plans. So commercial fishing, recreational fishing, transportation, those are outside of those plans. But when it comes to tenuring of um, aquaculture, say log storage and handling forestry, um, where it intersects with the marine, that's covered off. And those plans do identify sort of areas, um, initial thoughts around areas for protection and conservation. So we can build off those. Um, and those those plans as well had a, had 
quite significant stakeholder engagement um, in the development there. So there has been input and consideration for identifying areas, say, well, we call them uh, special management zones, say for future wind farm or for shellfish aquaculture or you know, whatever the activity may be. So there's some of that to build on. Um, and then in terms of uh, stakeholder group interests um, in the MPA network itself, um, you know, we do have these stakeholder advisory groups, um, one regional one, one for each of the subregions. So we're still keeping that subregional approach for our space. Um, and they, so they're, they're engaged that way. We're going out, we're, st we're still in the development of the network. So we're still very much in the planning phase. Um, so yeah, their, their way in is, is, is basically through engagement in the MPA network process. And then of course, they also have the ability to to uh, you know, approach any of the government ministries directly if they're if they're feeling and and they will if they're feeling if their interests interests are not being well represented. Um, you know, it, it is definitely going to there's going to be some trade offs. Conservation yeah. comes at a, at a short term and me, and medium term cost to to some sectors, and right. so that that's that's where the the politics come into play down the road. Great, thank you. Can I uh, also ask another question? Uh, I was wondering, you mentioned that the uh, conservation targets with, for ecology and for the First Nation, like the cultural, are, do have quite an overlap. Have you experienced any kind of major conflict between uh, the ecological uh, conservation objectives and the, between the ones from the well, First Nation? I mean, I can, I, I can imagine they're quite resourceful. I mean, I, I'm not quite familiar with, with the way they make use of the natural environment, but in general, you would think that they are resourceful. Yet, if there would be too many MPAs excluding them from making use of those, uh, are there any major conflicts arising, or has that already happened? Well, so so in general, in in, in Canada, um, First Nation use is is considered acceptable in in marine protected areas. Um, and you know that said, that generally ex well it excludes commercial use. So mm -hmm. it's it's more for sustenance use versus for commercial sale. Um, at, at this point, there's actually some some cases going through the court and different um, re recent sort of decisions that make that a little bit grayer, so to speak. Mm. Um, but generally, it's assumed that uh, indigenous harvest will continue in in marine protected areas. So we 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 try to account for that um, with a little bit of scaling in the high protection zones. That we do scale it down a little bit to reflect that there will be some res resource use continuing. But generally, they they sort of work in parallel. Um, you know, it's seen as seen as a benefit where you're both getting ecological and cultural benefits from an area. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you. Are there any more questions from uh, speakers, uh, the audience? No, I think this this has been great. I very much appreciate all the the, the talks and the participation it's been a fun discussion for me yes thank you i agree um well i guess we can uh, wrap it up by this thank you very much everyone for uh joining in and uh contributing to this discussion uh, i wish you a great evening great day depending on where you are and i hope to see you again thanks very much yes. thank thanks you. everybody thank you for the presentation thanks very much bye bye, now. bye, -bye.